Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Steely Hill podcast. Uh, on my first episode, or on the first episode, and it was really two because I fucked up uh, the, the recording and, and it split into two parts. But it's really just think of it as one, right? The Steely Dan original run um, is what we talked about. Went through the, the pre Dan information, uh, basic biography on, on Becker and Fagan. Uh, some of that Kenny Vance, Braille building stuff, and then kind of went through the albums. Um, I happen to gush a lot over Asian Gaucho and the Royal Scam, um, but they are uh, what I consider the top three Steely Dan albums. Um, if we left off with Gaucho from 1980, I'm actually going to uh, send us forward in time uh, 20 years, technically 19, because I want to talk about something that was released in 1999. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, the two, uh, they're, they're called the reunion albums of Steely Dan, 2000's Two Against Nature and 2003's, three, four, that's oh, right, three, 2003's uh, Everything Must Go. Uh, two albums that admittedly I had some trouble getting into when I first listened to them, when I first started exploring the uh, discography of the Dan, but they both after many listens and, and kind of understanding where Becker and Fagan were at that time in their career, uh, two albums I've really come to, to love, especially Two Against Nature. Um, two Against Nature, I think, is a top five Dan album, uh, which is very controversial. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people say that Everything Must Go is the worst Dan album. I disagree. I think it's the second worst, or the second not as, as, as the best. I think it's excellent. Uh, but I actually do rank the debut Can't Buy a Thrill from 1972 uh, the worst. Maybe when I get there, um, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll discuss that. But basically from 1980 to about 1993, Steely Dan, there was no, no noise from Steely Dan. Uh, Donald Fagan recorded uh, two solo albums, the first one being The Nightfly, uh, the second one is uh, from 1982. The second being Kamakiriad from, I believe, 1993. I have the Nightfly on vinyl. I've listened to Kamakiriad. Um, I do plan on owning it at some point. Uh, the Nightfly, I think, is excellent. Um, Kamakiriad, I like. Um, and 1994, Becker released his first studio album, uh, 11 Tracks of Whack. However, I'm not going to discuss the uh, the solo projects. Uh, that will be another, another podcast. So... From 1980 to 1993, there was no Steely Dan. Now there was, Becker was produ Becker cleaned himself up with producing uh, different bands, uh, including producing and writing with Fagan on Comic Curia, which is why I mentioned that. Um, Becker, uh, Fagan did the solo albums, I think did a little producing and uh, helped produce and write on 11 Tracks of Rock by Walter Becker. So kind of that 91 to 94, there was this collaboration, uh, producing-wise, writing-wise. But there was a Staley Dan reunion tour in 1993 with a, with a second tour in 1994. And this was kind of, and once again, this is another pod. This was predicated on kind of Fagan getting out to uh, perform at small clubs. Uh, there were some things he did with Michael McDonald, Boss Gags. Um, Walter started to play again, and, and, and they just decided it was time. So there was a tour in 90, they were, they, I mean, there were a couple of tours, 93, 94, culminated with the release of a CD called Alive in America. Um, but they were just touring for, you know, the majority of the 90s. The one thing that Becker and Fagan never wanted to do was touring. And this, this chunk of the live, the live Dan will be another pod. So we'll have the, the solo material to look forward to. We'll have this kind of 93 to, to, to 2000. Um, but it was seven years of touring, and then they came out with... Um, 2000s, Two Against Nature. Prior to this, Dan fans, what are you doing? Sorry, my cats, they play, you know how cats are. Um, prior to this, in 1999, Silly Dan released, um, or not Silly Dan, but Image Entertainment released a um, classic album, Steely Dan Asia. Um, what are you doing? Um, and if you know anything about the classic album series, I believe it's a bridge production where they take a, uh, the, you know, they, they 
take a famous album, take all the artists who are still with us. I mean, I'm sure it's ended. There's no more. But they did. They took the <coughs> artists who were still with us and kind of break down their writing, recording, producing of um, of the out of of an album. Looking on the back, they have just name a few: uh, "Catch a Fire" by Bob Marley, "Joshua Tree" by U2, "Who's Next" by The Who, "Electric Layland" by Jimi Hendrix, "Rumors" by Fleetwood Mac, "Songs in the Key of Life," one of my favorite albums ever by Stevie Wonder. Um, and the only reason I talk about it here is it's not really apropos to kind of that live ninety three to two thousand Dan. It doesn't really go obviously have anything to do with doesn't have anything to do with the, the solo material. I just want to talk about it. it. It's it's quite excellent. It's only like it's only an hour. Um but you know it, it's really cool watching Be- uh Becker and Fagan behind the, the panel and showing us tracks, like underlying tracks, you know, little things you might have missed. Uh some of the cut solos from Peg they kind of <coughs> go through and laugh about and um you know, Michael McDonald gets interviewed, Gary Katz, Roger Nichols. It's really great. It really is. Um, and definitely a great watch, a very meme-worthy. There's the meme of them, uh, of Becker and Fagan playing the beginning of Black Cow, and uh, Fagan starts rapping um, Uptown Baby, because there was that, that song, Uptown Baby, by... I forget who did it. Um, I'll look it up real quick. <coughs> There's a song, Uptown Baby, that sampled... Black Cow, um, Uptown Baby. Oh, uh, Uptown Baby by Lord. Well, it's technically Deja Vu, Uptown Baby by Lord Tariq and Peter Guns. Uh, and then we have there's a whole thing with lawsuits and Fagan Becker are the hundred percent writers of a rap tune because they. Anyway, so there's that meme. There's the meme where uh, Bernard, I think Bernard Purdy, Bernard Purdy talking about how you know he's a hit maker and. And, and he just goes on and just lists like every artist he's worked with. It's really great. Um, I'm just a huge fan. 1999. Anyway, Two Against the Nature came out in 2000. There was nine tracks, including the longest uh, Studio Studio Dan track, which is West of Hollywood, which ends with a four-minute, uh, I believe, tenor sax solo, and it's it's ripping. But this album, you know, was predicated on on like seven years of touring. Um, some of the songs they would demo on tour, especially, uh, I heard Jack of Speed, uh, and I'll have to find a, a recording of that, Jack of Speed Live, which is one of my favorites from this album. Uh, and Becker was actually singing it um, live, and I heard it was a little s- faster? I think it was a little faster. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 too against nature. Um, kind of like before, and I got a used copy off of eBay just to kind of have the liner notes so mine's a little more square um you know this this album kind of continues the trend of, of hiring studio musicians to perform uh the tunes however as you look through the uh the, the liner notes you see a lot of, a lot of names come up that are repeated throughout um the session so it's more like katie lied where it's like there is the session musician thing, but there's there's very much this, or uh, or even a uh, royal scam where it's like yes we have our session musicians, but we only have a couple and they you know they kind of play on most of the tracks. While when you get to Asia and Gaucho, we know that every track has an almost different lineup, if not completely different. Uh, but here you know I'm seeing Chris Potter on tenor sax, uh, Carolyn Lenhard uh, and her brother Michael Lenhard. I see uh, Jim Poo or Jim Pug. I'm not sure how you pronounce that on the drums. Um, some Gordon Gottlieb percussion. Like there's this, there's a consistency through some of these studio musicians. The drums do change quite a bit. Um, most famously, Keith Carlock on Two Against Nature, who we will talk about later. Um, but yeah, it's oh, that is on sound. Um, it's just a really great album. When I first heard it, like I said, I wasn't. Um, a huge fan. I thought some of the songs were a little long in the tooth. Um, but they kind of went on for a couple more spins of, you know, the, the chord progressions or whatever than they, they needed to. But really, I really, like I said, this is my fourth or fifth favorite Steely Dan album. Um, the album cover, once again, shitty Steely Dan album covers, is this. Uh, this is a photo from the 70s, allegedly. Uh, it's not Fagan and Becker. It's just like this random photograph. 
and that's often mistaken. People are like, oh yeah, it's 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 it would be uh, Fagan and Becker because I think Becker was a tiny bit more heavy set. Um, but no, it's just like a random photo. Um, I find the uh, the two there like it's two against nature, and it says it in text, but like just the two there is kind of weird. Um, I mean, this kind of font choice is repeated in the liner notes, um, which that works there. I guess it's tying that together. You can also think of this as like Steely Dan Mach 2 because it is what, what people call the, the reunion albums. Um, but like this track list is like... Uh, before we talk about the tunes, let's talk about Sonics. Uh, I believe this was recorded digitally, um, which, you know, is, is Fabi Fagan did that for, for the Nightfly, from what I believe. So, I mean, they were using the cutting-edge technology um, and, and, you know, you, you do have some of that airiness and that, that cleanness, clean, like cleanliness between, between different instruments that like Asian Goucher had, but like sound wise in terms of like genre or style, you know, if you think about OG Steely Dan, it was, it was, there's a lot of rocker tunes, um, really with, with, you know, Countdown to Ecstasy is the, is kind of like the rocker album. Pretzel Logic are kind of these short pop songs. Pity Lied, kind of they start the jazzy thing. Um, Royal Scam is is both kind of like shuffly and a rocker at the same time. You think of like Kid Charlemagne going right into Kids and Altamira, kind of balances balances the two. Uh, and then Asia is like the jazz <coughs> epic, and Gaucho is like the, the yacht rockiest yacht rock Steely Dan ever was. Um, I find, even though there is a 20-year gap between Gaucho and, and, eight, and uh, Two Against Nature, I find that, that the songs here, it's like a direct continuation of Gaucho. There is a lot of artifici artificiality to these songs, and I think that was a deliberate production choice. You know, being in the, the, 20, the 21st century, the, uh, everything, every, all the production choices could be so clean. It's really crisp. Um, but you can hear all the instruments really perfectly. It's, it's blended well without anything being muffled. Um, songwriting, kind of, I mean, it's that, I mean, there's always that Steely Dan ick. Um, I think this song has the second ickiest Steely Dan song uh, with, with Cousin Dupree, which I'll get to. Um, but it's so, like, you can almost dance to some cuts from this album. Like Gaslighting Abbey, Jack of Speed's like a cool kind of. It's like one of those like cops, cop like cop show songs. Um, really cool Vegan vocal inflections. Like there's the uh, kind of the triplet thing happening in West of Hollywood. Um, there's the cool thing in Gaslighting Abbey where like the it's the the flame is the game and you would think the bass would just be kind of chugging along doing the bass thing. But the bass is like doing this weird like counterpoint. Uh, excuse me. Or doing like this weird counterpoint to, to Fagan's voice that's like, it's like not in the, it's like not, I have to sit down with it and, and, and plunk it out because it's like not in the same key or it's it's not harmonized as, as, as like a traditional harmonization. But I mean, it works great. So it's obviously, it's all kind of within the chord, I'm assuming, but... Very interesting. Anyway, nine tracks. It, it, it comes. It comes out at like forty-five minutes. Um, Gaslighting Abbey, uh, the first track, um, literally about gaslighting. Some guy is is basically having an affair, and and he's trying to convince his his wife that uh, it's not happening. And there's like a line where, uh, where is it? The black mini. Um, yeah. Uh, that black mini looks just like the one she's been missing. Feels good on you. Like now he's just giving his mistress uh, his wife's clothes. Flame is the game. The game we call Gaslighting Abbey. It's a luscious invention for three. One summer by the sea. Yeah, it's just like a summer romance. <coughs> but it's like obviously, um, you know, a little more treacherous than that with the, um, you know, the fact that it's an affair. What a Shame About Me might be the funniest Steely Dan song in a lot of ways. Um, essentially, there's some guy just got out of rehab. He's working like a retail job. He's kind of like slumming it. And uh, Franny from NYU, who's an old old college uh, flame or girlfriend of his. I mean, they were friends, but it's also implied there was some romance. 
uh, comes into the shop and they just start talking. And she tells him about all the shit she's been doing. He tells her, like, gotta have rehab, working on a book that I'm not gonna finish. They talk about, like, their old mutual friends and how it seems like everyone except the narrator is a, is a success, which, which I think is, is, is real life. You know, I think a lot of us feel that way. Uh, I know I do. In a lot of cases, I feel like a failure of sorts. Um, you know, in, uh, in some aspects and other aspects, I think I, I have a good thing going. But, you know, that's just that, that human condition that I think Steely Dan really uh, lays into. However, here's where it, I mean, the, the whole chorus is what a shame about me, um, which is funny. I mean, it's, it's very much like egg on the face. But where it turns, which I think is where the real humor comes in, is is they were like done talking, you know, you like, it's weird sometimes meeting up with people where you're, you know, that, that you've, out of touch with it and you're at two kind of separate points of life it, it, it can get weird um this is the last verse we both read out of small talk the connection seemed good uh or this connection seemed to go dead i was about to say hey have a nice life uh when she touched my hand and said you know i just had this great idea this could be very cool why don't we grab a cab to my hotel and make believe we're back at at our old school so she's like yeah maybe maybe she's like Remembering old times, maybe it's a it's a it's a pity fuck, you know. I don't know. It's Steely Dan. It could be both. It could be neither. Um, and the the cool so thing about this song is is the chorus is the same melody, but the lyrics change. Um, and once again, very cool kind of triplet thing that uh, Fagan's doing. I said, "Babe, you look delicious, and you're standing very close, but this is Lower Broadway, and you're talking to a ghost. Take a good look. It's easy to see. What a shame about me." So he's like, he's so in his in his self doubt and self pity, he just like turns down sex from a, a actor actor musician. I find it very funny. Uh, Two against nature, which once again fe features um, where is he, Keith Carlock on drums. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it just seems like. Like, I mean, it's the title track. It, it seems like Fagan and Becker are just like, we're back. We're taking over again. You know, with very, very much, uh, you know, very much, th what is it, thumbing their nose or whatever. I don't know. I just, it's really great. Um, throughout Fagan's vocals, it's really airy because he is like, he's older and he's singing in the same or even a higher range than they did on, on previous records. I kind of like it because because he has to sing kind of breathy, and it's it's got that kind of. It like it's like a different kind of snarl, you know. It's not a snarl, but that's I think it's like the, it's, it enforces what it's not because of what it is sort of thing, uh, and I don't really have the words, to um. I don't know. It's just it's it's really great, and and I cannot sing, along with Donald Fagan, like. All the songs would have to be put like a fifth or sixth lower for me to sing along with them. Like I try to sing Peg in the car. And like to sing Donald's like parts, I have to sing falsetto. Or like a really weak, wimpy chest voice. And it's like and then I try to sing them down an octave. And sometimes it dips too low. And then I can't. Like I try to sing FM. And it just doesn't and I love that song, but it is what it is. Uh, number four, Janie Runaway. Basically, it's about a, a Floridian woman, young woman, like all Steely Dan songs are. And uh, she kind of gets together with a, uh, a sugar daddy. And there's this really funny line in here. Here it is. It's the, once again, this is one of those, the chorus changes every time, like uh, uh, lyrically. Who has a friend named Melanie who's not afraid to try new things? Who gets to spend her birthday in Spain? Possibly you, Janie Runaway. So it's this, this Floridian runaway girl. This guy is, you know, being a sugar daddy, pervert on her. And then, it's, <laughs> and then it's basically like, yeah, you wanna go to Spain? You wanna go visit? Well, take your friend and we're gonna, you know, fuck the whole time. Like the three of us. Great song. Almost gothic. I'm not actually sure what this is about. Uh, I will be honest. I. Even though I love the chorus, the she's almost gothic in a natural way. I I don't know. I think it's just about like 
a, like a woman lying to a man. Uh, I kind of skip it when it's on. Something about it's just like, I like it. Like, if I'm doing album listens. But, like, if I'm going from Jamie Runaway to get to Jack of Speed, which is the six, which is four, five, six, five being almost gothic, I'll just skip it. Because Jack of Speed is like, it's so slick and so smooth and is like, it's very gaucho. Um, because it is, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, something about like the, that mid slow tempo kind of groovy kind of number. Uh, the song's about a, a man. Um, like an old has been who's like getting back on the drugs, uh, speed probably because Teddy's the uh, the jack of speed. Really funny line here, uh, the second verse. Sheena's party. Uh, there's a case in point that right wing hooey sure stunk up the joint. Uh, so basically, it's like probably some old Reaganomics guy who's like just kind of getting drunk and and fucked up again, and just like everyone's over him. Um, I just like the term right wing hooey, um, which might tell you a little bit about my uh, political leanings, but. I digress. Cousin Dupree. Cousin Dupree is, like I said, the second creepiest Steely Dan song, in my opinion. Otis, he's fine. He's just a glutton for food, and he, they get they get wet food at seven. Otis, he needs stuff. Or he sees ghosts. You're not a cat star. But um, the first, the, the creepiest Steely Dan song being uh, Everyone's Gone to the Movies from... Uh, Kitty lied because it's about a, an adult man from the neighborhood showing children a, a, like adult films and then, you know, when they turn 18, trying to coerce. It's very gross. Obviously, obviously, it's it's awful. I actually skip it a lot when I listen to Kitty Lied. Um, it's like a great, musically, it's a great song. It's like kind of um, Calypso influence, but like, I can't, I can't. Like, that's. And obviously, it's all a condemnation, and like people like that, that and like that exists in the world, which is is, is part of the Steely Dan ethos. They'll sing about like real life scenarios. Otis, sing about like real life scenarios uh, of like the scummiest people. But I skip it. Cousin Dupree, I don't skip. And actually, Cousin Dupree was the lead single of the song, and I or <coughs> Cousin Dupree was the lead single from the album, and and it's 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 about oh, uh, what do they call it? A down home family romance. So it's it's this, it's this loser, like it's probably in his thirties or forties, middle aged loser, living on his aunt's couch, and his cousins, his girl cousins, also living at home, and he's just perving over her, um, with the chorus, "Otis, you are ruining this. You need some stuff. There is nothing. You're gonna get food in like an hour. Some stuff." He's uh, he get, like gets in on these weird kicks where like everything's fine, and he just he's just being being a glutton, and it's it's very annoying sometimes. But he's my little boy, and I love him. Um, anyway, um, where was I? So yeah, it's just like this guy perving on his cousin, uh, who's the same age. The chorus, uh, how about a kiss for your cousin Dupree? And like, there's a she had like a boyfriend over and they were they were making out he's just like sitting there and he got pissed off and it's very i mean it's very creepy obviously uh but it's very funny because uh, it's just another another loser in the steely dan verse um negative girl song eight another negative girl at the edge of the frame deliciously toxic the original classic thing more of the same uh We've all had, um, maybe not all of us, but but a lot of men have had like the maybe multiple uh, women who are um, I don't want to say crazy because that's that's like mean, but like those girls that are a little maybe they're bipolar, maybe they're a little cracked out. Not literally or figuratively, um, but but like you're drawn to it. I don't know how women are with crazy guys. I feel like crazy crazy guys kill their girlfriends, um, <laughs> which isn't good. But I had a I had a partner like this for for a minute, 
deliciously toxic is, uh, hi, Otis. Yes, you're being Glenn. I love you. I want to say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. Otis, say hi to everyone. Otis, say hi to everyone. It's the Steely Phil podcast. Your dad's doing something. Boo, 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 boo. My little boy. Um, all right, yeah, see, now you're stuck with me. That's what you get for trying to bully me and giving me food. Uh, I don't know, but going back, uh, deliciously toxic, I think, is a apt way to describe at least my feelings toward uh, this person. Um, another great song. Just, just Steely Dan being Steely Dan, and finally, West of Hollywood. Um, once again, another song, I'm not really sure of the uh, the intention. Uh, like Kind of like the song Asia, I just wasn't sure. Uh, chorus, I'm riding deep into nothing special, riding the crest of a wave breaking uh, just west of Hollywood. I don't know, it's like, there's just like a lot of like references and like weird characters he's creating. Uh, it says, meet if you will, Dr. Warren Kruger. I don't know if that's a real person or not. Let's look it up. Is that anyone, or is that just... Oh. Oh, here we go. Uh, Quara. Uh, it, this is the story of love lost told to your friend or shrink by a man in the TV industry, which is based in Culver City, California. Um, yeah, I... Maybe drugs, maybe... Um, maybe just, like... A bad relationship, like most Celia songs are. Um, I need to make it with a stop. Give me a second. Sorry, I caved and uh, gave him food because I would like to continue this podcast. But when he starts bugging me later, because it's off by an hour, that's on him. Cats. Um, overall, great album. Overall, like I said, my fourth or fifth Celia Dan album. Kind of a musical continuation of Gaucho, but in the new millennia, it's kind of its own thing. Because Gaucho kind of stands on its own, being that it was released later, being that it was with MCA, being that it was much more fake than Becker because of Becker's problems. Love this album. Uh, to promote this album, there was a PBS special that was later released on DVD. Um, it was a PBS special, from what I believe, but it was called Two Against Nature, Steely Dance, Plush TV, Jazz Rock Party, and Sensuous Surround Sound. From my understanding, this concert was recorded before the album came out. They were both released the same year. I'm not sure if you could get like a, a twofer pack, like at a, at a, I guess, FYE at that time. Uh, what would it be? Tweeter? No. Whatever, one of those, you know, FYEs or whoever sold CDs. Um, but they do complement each other. Um, what's cool about this is um, a lot of the band from this are, are people who played on the album. Um, which is fun. John Harrington on guitar. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, you know, what's, what's their roles on this album? Uh, Becker does a lot of guitar, a couple solos, a little bit of bass. Uh, Fagan obviously singing and doing his Fender Rhodes. Uh, but it is important to know because Becker was always like the, oh, they hired Chuck Rainey and then they had like, um, you know, all those great guitarists uh, who I can't think of right now. Uh, Kid Charlemagne solo. Um, it was all over the world scan. Why can I not? Think of his name. Sorry, had a long day. Um, Kid Charlemagne solo. Larry Carlton. Sorry, Larry Car Carlton on uh, guitar. Walter Becker did some guitar work. I believe he played on Josie and did the solo, which is excellent. But on the previous tours, this album. The next album, the DVD, whatever. Uh, he played guitar, and he's a wonderful guitar player. Usually won't play lead, 
but would do some great comping with like these really complicated Sui Dan chords. Um, but this set list is cool. Now I'm not sure if this is the entire set list or it was like or this is a a trimmed down version. It is how long? Uh, 140 minutes. There's some. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the one. Yeah, this has some interview stuff cut cut between. You know songs. Uh, or we start Green Earrings. Cousin Dupree, which from the new album was not like out in public yet. I don't even think it was it was released as a single yet. Bad Sneakers, Jamie Runaway, also same thing on the new album. Not heard yet. Josie FM, Gaslighting Abbey, new album, not heard yet. Black Friday, Babylon Sisters, Kid Charlemagne, Jack of Speed, which I think is Donald. I think it, they finally switched it over because I mean it was the first one on the album, right? With Donald singing. Uh, Peg, What a Shame About Me. Once again, hasn't been heard yet. Uh, Pretzel Logic. And, uh, you know, that's the end. So. We have one, two, three, four, five songs in a 15 song set. Sorry, 14 song set. We have five songs in a 14 song set from the new album. Um, let's see, we have what, like, sorry, I'm trying to do some quick. We have one non album track with FM. We don't have anything from Can't Buy Thrill. We have. Nothing from oh, they don't play Blade Software. Uh, they don't nothing from uh, uh, Countdown to Ecstasy. One song from Pretzel Logic. One, uh, one, two songs from Kitty Lied. Two songs from Royal Scam. Sorry. Sorry, three. Uh, wait. Yeah, two songs from Royal Scam. Uh, one, two songs from Asia. One from Gaucho. I might have mathed a little bit wrong. I'm just kind of. But it's a really good performance. It's really easy to come by on the secondhand market. I love these really simple, kind of thin, kind of DVD cases. You know, all your info's there. There's not like paper to get lost. Do damage easier, but you know, we're all adults here, so that shouldn't be a problem. Or the worst was the worst. Just buy a new one, they're pretty easy to get online. Um, so it was 2000. I think they tore it off that album. I'm not sure all the intimate details. I'm reading a book about kind of everything. Um, like all their tours of this time and things like that. Um, but it took them three years to, to come out with Everything Must Go. Uh, Everything Must Go is often derided as the worst Steely Dan album. Uh, like I said in the beginning, I, I, I differ on that. I think Can't Buy Thrill is than this. Uh, and the reason it's thought that is, is people say this album loses some of the polish that they've really perfected on Gaucho and later Two Against Nature and, the, and the Asia. Um, they say the songs aren't that memorable. Um, People hate uh, Becker doing his first studio singing on a Dan record with uh, song number five, Slang of Ages. Um, I like this album quite a bit. Um, I, I On first listen, the first couple of listens, I did find a lot of the songs forgettable, but I find that the, the genius in this album is, is really the lyrics. Um, while most Steely Dan songs are like the music and the lyrics, this is really just the lyrics, which I think is why it falls <coughs> falls flat because it doesn't have the, the music back back to back it up. Um, but interestingly enough, this is the first Steely Dan song. Sorry, first Steely Dan album since Countdown to Ecstasy, where there's like a band. Um, now obviously there are some some different personnel. But for most of the band, it's like Fagan on uh, vocals and, and Fender Rhodes or Wurlitzer or whatever. Um, Walter Becker on bass with some solo guitar. Keith Carlock on drums. Keith Carlock, uh, who I mentioned, who played on the song Two Against Nature, from Two Against Nature. 
from after that recording session, that tour forward, he would play on, I think, the entirety of this album, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and do like do all their tours. He did the second Becker um, solo album. He did the, the third and maybe fourth Fagan uh, studio album, solo record. Um, but yeah, so there's like this tight band that I, I'm pretty sure... I know Keith Carlock did the tour for Two Against Nature. I think a lot of these these guys and girls did. Um, and so that's cool, because it's like the first time since 1973 we're getting pure band Steely Dan, because if you remember, uh, with with Press Logic, like Jim Hodder didn't play any drums. They got a lot of session musicians. Um, so that's kind of cool. They recorded this bat, uh, on Analog, which is interesting, which uh, there is a, of the two... Uh, comeback albums. There are, I'm saving up for them. They're uh, 45 RPM double disc uh, LPs, and I'd love to compare the sound from, especially this, the CD to the, um, the vinyl because of the analog recording technique. Um, but yeah, so this is a band recording. So they recorded like the band like live, or like took the rhythm section to get like they didn't build it up the track. The song track by track, like they did on every album from, I guess, basically Katie Lied to uh, Two Against Nature. So that's cool. Uh, I really like some of these songs. The Last Mall, well, let's talk. This is 2003. They were living in New York when I'm in 2001. Um, and the, the result of that, there was the, the 9 11 attacks and then the resulting Iraq War. So you would think that a lot of these songs just because of the nature of where they were living and what happened, that, that maybe they, they make reference to it, and they really don't, which I guess is very much, you know, why would they do that when there's, you know, they see the, the humor and sarcasm and so many other things that make their music topical all of a sudden, you know. I mean, they were probably sick of hearing the, the news about the, the war and everything. They were just, they turned their minds off of it. That being said, the last mall could kind of fit into this kind of mindset of, uh, you know, the, the, the attacks. Um, so the first song, last mall, attention all shoppers, it's cancellation day. Yes, the big adios is just a few hours away, basically like impending apocalypse. Uh, but it's about people shopping at the mall on like Apocalypse Day. It's very funny. Um, roll your cart back up the aisle, kiss the checkout girls goodbye, ride the ramp to the freeway beneath the blood orange sky. Uh, Things I Miss the Most is a song about uh, an older single man, who would have thought, reminiscing about a former love. And you know, talking about the things he missed the most. Um, the first chorus has the talk, the sex. Oh, that's, we put that second B. Somebody to trust. Okay, we're kind of back on the right path. The Audi TT, the house on the vineyard, the house on the Gulf Coast. These are the things I miss the most. So he just wants like a therapist and sex. And like a nice house, which I guess who doesn't? But once again, it's like the deep down, we all kind of have these, these, these base needs maybe. But it's a great song. Just nice and funky. Just like a slow jam. Uh, Blues Beach was a release as a single. Um, I think the last small was. I actually don't know all the, the singles. I think there were three for this album. Maybe I do know them. Anyway. Um, I don't know. Blues Beach, I don't really like it. I don't know, it's just about, like, I think it's just about, like, running away to, to the beach, or really anywhere, but specifically the beach when, you know, things get rough. Uh, you know, I think a fight with a girlfriend. I don't know. I just I just never cared for it. Now, Godwhacker is probably the best song of the album. Uh, Godwhacker was written after Fagan's mom passed away. I guess, I guess... That pissed him off. 
who wrote a song about how people killing God, like the Ghostbusters, uh, catching ghosts. Um, it's like, I think the one song that came up like in the set lists after this tour uh, from this album, it's really funny. Yes, we are the God Whackers who rip and chop and slice for cries beyond imagining. It's time to pay the praise. Pay the praise. Better step back, son. Give the man some whack in space. You know this might get messy. Got whackers on the case. Yeah, it's just like God. You did so many, literally God. You did so many awful things. Uh, you should eat your fate. And it's so funny to me. And and because of course Donald Fagan would react musically or writing to his mother's passing this way. Of course he would. I'm sure Walter Becker would too. Like it's just it's what you expect. Slang of Ages is uh, the song that Becker sings. It's just kind of about a guy trying to, an older man trying to fit in with like young people, probably a girl, but like young people using like slang. Um, one of my favorite lines are, now did you say you were from the Netherlands or was that netherworld? If you grew up in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam then I'm the Duke of Earl. <sighs> he used like, you ought to, uh, there's some other, Let's roll with the homies, knock on wood. Like, just, like, weird, out-of-touch lines. Um, Becker has this really mellow, kind of chill voice. Uh, he's in a lower range um, than Don Fagan. He's probably closer to, to, probably is a baritone. I would describe Fagan as a tenor, um, which I can kind of sing along to. I don't know. It's kind of like a funky, it's like a slow funk, slow jam verse, and then... The, the, the chorus has like these wonderful background singers and just kind of elevate the song. I think on this song, there were two, there'd be two other songs I would skip before I skip Slang of Ages. Three other? I'd skip Blues Beach, Green Book. I guess just two. But like, people skip that one all the time. I, I like it. I like Becker's voice, it's different. Um, it's not great. I guess neither is Fagan's, but I think they, they their voices serve a purpose to deliver the lyrics. Uh, Green Book. I think it's about attending a club. A lot of these, I, I haven't deep dived in the lyrics as much as I should have. Um, I think it's just like going down to a club or like a hotel and trying to meet someone. She's kind of cute, but a little younger. <laughs> She's got the mood and the moves. It's kind of scary to dig yourself in the green book. Just not a huge fan of the song. I don't know. Once again, this is why it's it's near the bottom of my list because some songs I really like. Maybe I love the last and all, or things I miss the most. No, it's Godwacker I love. I really like things I miss the most and the last and all. But I don't know. Pixeline's cool. Pixeline's like a. It's kind of like a Janie Runaway where it's like this this girl kind of on the run, except she's born in the bogs of Jersey. And it's kind of like this weird kind of sci-fi, you know, pixel We're talking 2003 when, like, technology, like, kind of cell phones and pixels were kind of being, like, really talked about. Um, Pixeline, rave on my sleek and soulful cyber queen. Pixeline, penned by a hack in the Palisades, backed by some guys from Columbia. Shot all in digital video for a million and change. He's like dealing drugs or running drugs while, you know, it's kind of like this cool kind of sci-fi aesthetic. Lunch with Gina is about, it's kind of the similar topic of uh, Negative Girl. Where it's like, we all love that crazy broad, you know. Uh, this one seems like Gina just got out of the psych ward and like tracked some guy down. And of course the endless afternoon, it started on the day I met her. Lunch with Gina's forever. Uh, but there's also... Like, just like the Negative Girl, it's like, it's crazy. This is crazy, but I like it. Uh, last verse, I'm in a cozy booth, maybe my watch is fast, another tank array, I'll wait till 20 past. I'm about to go postal when she waltzes in, I guess she's a knockout, hey, where have I been? So by the beginning of the song, it's like this innocent guy, and by the end, like, he's going crazy, kind of because of her. Very funny. Very amusing. Uh, everything Must Go. Is is like a like a big goodbye, and I heard Silly Dan were playing on making another album. 
after uh, everything must go, but a lot of this album with everything must go the title track last mall things i miss the most god whacker it seems very like end of end of the line you know this is the end uh finn you know sort of thing everything must go is is just about a mall closing down but you know the mall is a metaphor for for life uh funny funny thing i like uh, so it's it's just about like coworkers, right? They're just kind of like closing up the shop, you know, the mall for the last time, because it's because the mall's closing, right? So they're just like everything must go, you know, on those sales. Uh, Tell me you can dig in, Miss Fugazi. Now it's gone from late to later. Frankly, I could use a little FaceTime in the service elevator. So he's like, oh, we're all losing our jobs. You wanna you wanna you know you wanna do a quickie? And then end of day from acquisitions wants to get in on the action with his handy cam in tow. But we're going out of business. Everything must go. Yeah, we're losing our minimum wage job, so let's make a porno in the fucking elevator. Very funny. Um, not an awful album. Not a fantastic knockout 10 out of 10. I'd rate it an 8 out of 10. 8 and a half. Like, there are some songs I really like, but the ones I don't like, Green Book, just or Blues Beach, just don't do it for me. Uh, two cool pieces of media to go along with this. Uh, the one a lot of people know about, and the one I actually literally just found out about um, like a week ago. Uh, so there was a show on HBO at the time called, um, what was it, like Taxi Cab Confidential or something, um, where they, it was like Gonzo style, like they would film, like the host would drive around in a taxi in New York, and, you know, they just try to get crazy people and, and have them, you know, ask or answer crazy questions and i've never watched it, it seems a little voyeur, voyeuristic to me and that's not really my scene um i don't know i just something about cabs and asking people questions and obviously there is a, a c element to that it's like it's fit steely dan uh the the concept not really the guys i think they're just two like normal guys who are just like crotchety but uh the show produced a special episode called steely dan confessions and it's walter and becker is riding in the back of a taxi and they just pick up people. They all happen to be young women, which I'm sure is um, intentional. And they're like not, they're not creepy. Um, they're just kind of droll and drab. And then there's like some famous memeable moments where like Donald is like yelling at the, uh, the McDonald's uh, drive through. It's like one cup of coffee. And Becker's like, I'd take another one. Two cups of coffee. And he's yelling. There's one where this girl claims that she's a fan of the band because she had a boyfriend in college who was a fan. And that her favorite song by them is Reeling in the Sheaves. Uh, it's like Reeling in the Years. And then she tries to sing the lyrics. And it's, it's like, Becker's face is so funny. Donald's like, yeah, Reeling in the Sheaves, that was their big hit. She's like, I love that song. It's only like half an hour, 24 minutes. It's, uh, it's a good watch. I think it's funny. Um, very memeable. A lot of Steely Dan memes, like video memes, you'll see like YouTube poops will... will be primarily that. Um, but this is something cool that I found from probably the same year. Uh, this one hour sale, which if you look, I love the cover. Uh, oh yeah, this cover, it's fine. It's just like a, you know, kind of jewel, jewelry, kind of, you know, New York City, Jewelers Row, or that's Philadelphia. No, is that New York City? That's New York City. Jewelers Row, just kind of like your sleazy guy smoking a cigar. Uh, but this cover, I really like. Uh, we can see it's in the same kind of style with the the random the random colored letters, uh, kind of mismatching the same kind of uh, film color. Uh, but this, oop, this I like because I don't know why there's like a flute case or something. I like that. Uh, but like these are very much Donald Fagan style shoes or loafers. These are very much Walter Becker style sneakers. Uh, it's probably theirs. Um, it's just like their personality. You know, Becker's kind of, Becker, was, everyone thinks he's a mysterious one. Uh, I think he's just like, he's just goofy. He's silly. He's like a dad. Um, I mean, he was a father. But this is cool. This is a, I'm trying to find the exact what this was. So there was a, it was an interview conducted uh, in California. And it was really just like a way to interview the band Uh and between little interview spots, there are, like, f like songs, right? So they have The Last Mall, Things I Miss the Most, Blues Beach, God Whacker, Song of Ages, Everything Must Go, which is, frankly, most of the album. 
Um, one, two, three, four, five, six out of nine tracks are here. Um, in full, which is great. There's like little little bumpers like, you know, Walter Becker. This is Walter Becker. Check out Everything Must Go. Your program returns in a moment, like one of those. Um, I listen to it. You know, it's just like typical... Typical uh, kind of interviewer stuff where Fagan and Becker are just kind of being dicks. But uh, it's cool. I didn't know it was a thing. I was on Discogs the other day and I saw this. And I'm like, it's at the bootleg. And then I looked. I'm like, oh, no, it's not. It's a, it's like a promo thing. So, you know, not, not everyone has. I didn't spend, I spent like, with shipping, probably 10 bucks on this. Uh, and it's a pretty good, good, good deal because, you know, the Silly Dan interviews from like Everything Must Go. No one really, because no one, people don't like the album. Um, oops, you want to be closer? Or not. Uh, so I, like, people don't really like this era. I like this era. I like the whole, like, post-reunion, like, 93 tour, and, like, just these two albums, like, kind of by themselves. Uh, music, musically, they're very similar. They kind of represent their own era of the Dan. Um, you know, the, the, the pre- Reunion tour years where it was just like solo projects and stuff are very interesting. Um, but this era, I don't know. I just, you know, it's like, oh, you have these 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 seven great Dan albums, but wait, there's more, and then you get two, which you know I think that do vary in quality, uh, unfortunately. But like, you know, let's say you you finish, you're 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 done listening to Asia for the billionth time or Gaucho for the billionth time. I'd say start with Two Against Nature, but then like pop this on. Uh, this I believe is shorter. What does it say? I think this is just like a little shorter. So just like give yourself like an hour and a half. Just put these two on. They're not gonna take that long. I think they're great albums. I really do. Um, like I said, I plan on getting the the vinyl releases so I can just like have the collection on vinyl. Um, but there's like a ton of other things to talk about. There, there's the uh, the most recent one, which is th this live album. Well, there's let's go back. I have a couple things. There was this is just one of their greatest hits collection that was expanded for CD. Um, it's got like some Donald Fagan stuff, and it's got like a live version of Bo uh, Bodhisattva that like their tour manager like was drunk and he called Fagan Mr. St Stevie Dan. It was very weird. Uh, but funny. There's like this live album, Live in America, which was uh, uh, just some of the tracks from the 93-94 tour. There was a, their most recent live album, which was actually them live uh, post Walter Becker passing away. I don't really care for this one. Like, I don't hate it. Um, I don't know. It's something just about like knowing that it's like Becker's not there. I don't know. It does have a cover, A Man Ain't Supposed to Cry, which is cool. But I, When I listen to Live Dan, I tend to listen to this one. I like the... Well, actually, when I listen to Live Dan, they're, they're, I watch like a, a bootleg from like their 93 tour uh, because that tour, they start with an instrumental medley that's not on this. Um, and it's it's the Royal Scam. And it, it, Fagan Becker's not playing on it. It's like before they come on the stage. So it's like the band. And it's the Royal Scam with the... Like, be ba 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 da ba and then and then it's it's Asia and then bad sneakers I think it's like it's like a eight minute medley maybe ten minute medley and uh, I think that's wonderful so this isn't like one of those whole whole shows um there was a and this is all stuff I'll talk about in another video like the Oz and Eds of Dan I'll have to get some more compilations and uh but uh, this is cool. Uh, this was done. This came out. This was '05, but it was recorded in 2002. So actually, it was between uh, the two reunion albums. So Mar Marion Mc was that her name? Mary McPartland uh, just had like a. It was called Piano Jazz Series on NPR, and she would just like talk to people and like jazz musicians. They would play their music with with like a little band, and uh, so they do like mostly cut like some Duke Ellington. Um, you know, some old kind of jazz standards. Uh, there's some interview in the middle. But they, Silly Dance Song-wise, they play Josie, uh, they play Ch Chain Lightning, and they 
played back Black Friday, you know, Josie being what Becca called a good R&B track, Chain Lightning being a shuffle, Black Friday kind of being a, a faster shuffle. Um, but the band is Donald Fagan singing and playing piano, Barry McPartland playing piano, so I don't know how the duties kind of, who does what. Becker on guitar. Then you have Jay Lenhart on bass. Jay Lenhart is the father of Carolyn Lenhart and Michael Lenhart, I believe is his name, who, who are all over the reunion albums. Let's see, what's his name? Lenhart, Lenhart, Lenhart. Michael Lenhart, sorry. Um, maybe I said that. Anyway, so he's like the father. He's like a noted old jazz bass player, and he's on there, which I'm sure is a real treat for Fagan and Becker. And then Keith Carlock on drums, because he's their guy. Like, it's just cool. Like, it's not really Steely Dan, but it really shouldn't be. I, with guests, Steely Dan sells more copies or gets more listens than with guests, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. But, like, Nick Partland, like, wasn't a huge Dan fan, like, for a while just because she didn't really listen to them and then she was recommended and she loved them and why wouldn't you? Um, see, not a lot of people know about this one. Like, I feel like it's pretty easy to get now, this was a radio broadcast. Like, it was NPR, it was a radio broadcast. I don't know. I feel like people, you know, it's like one of those things that kind of fall under the radar of Dan stuff. Um, this is on Spotify, though, which is how I first heard about it. Like, I don't even think I saw it on, like, I just ignored it on Wikipedia. Um, but, you know, in the future, but that's that. That's kind of this period of the Dan. Uh, in the future, I kind of t plan on talking about. Oh, and the reason I didn't mention this in uh, chronological order was I thought this was like 08. So I was going to scoot it, but I was wrong. Uh, which is why you can tell I don't have a script or know what I'm doing. Um, but there's more things to talk about. There's the solo careers. There's like the 93 tour. Um, well, there's the period of, of 80 to 93, which has some solo albums. And there's just the solo albums in general, because there are six now for Fagan and two Becker. Um, there's like the 93 tour era, and then there's like the off and on tour. Post There's the post Becker era, which we're in now. There's the uh, with the kind of the, the New York Rock and Soul Review, which had Fagan, Michael McDonald, Boz Gags, and uh, there's another person, Phoebe Snow, I think. Uh, Becker did a couple of those. Then there was the, the Dukes of September, which is just McDonald, Fagan, Boz Gags, and a backing band, and they do covers and tunes from everyone's kind of career. Really good stuff. Uh, but there's so much more to talk about. There's there's Steely Dan music theory to talk about with the, the Moo major chord. There's um, the prevalence of, of books and texts written about Steely Dan. Um, I've read Real in the Years, which I actually had an old edition, so I'm getting an a, a, a updated edition. There's the Asia 33 and a third I showed off in the last video. There's I'm reading Steely Dan FAQ now, which is this really thick, like, book that, like, can anything related to Steely Dan's in there. It's really cool. Um, there's, like, a fanzine I have from someone from England. Uh, there's some cool stuff. Uh, there's Eminent Hipsters, which is Fagan's book, which I'm, I'm doing, I plan on reading. I have it. Um, there's a book that, like, breaks down every track, which I, I, I think it's on track. I'm going to get. Um... You know, there's the bootleg scene. There's the Lost Gaucho. There's what uh, Sim C. Nichols, Roger Nichols, their, their chief engineer's daughter, has been uncovering, including the, the famous Schlitz beer jingle, or the infamous, because you never heard it. Um, you know, there's like what members are still alive doing interviews. You know, I'm pretty sure Denny Dias is still with us. Skunk Baxter, Jim Hodder, unfortunately, passed away. I think Chuck Rainey's still alive. Bernard Purdy sure certainly is. So there's a lot of avenues we could talk. We could talk about, you know, Fagan and Becker's musical influences. We can talk about who they influenced, who successfully covered Steely Dan and who has not. Um, so there is some really... Every every time I, I set out to learn... Oh, there's the Metal Leg fanzine, which I have most of the issues in a text format. I need to I need to con figure out someone who has it so I can type them up. Um, ooh, maybe I'll do an interlibrary loan search and I'll find something. Anyway, that's all I got today. Obviously not as long as my basically two hour last video. Um, yeah, I just, just came home from school in my normal time. I threw something in the crock pot and thought, why not have a little bit of gin? Give 
very strong idea. Put some seltzer water in it. Um, talk about, you know, two really great albums. Just got to finish out the um, studio discog and then we'll go from there. Anyway, that was the Silly Dad. Uh, that was the Silly Phil podcast, part two. Uh, out of, you know, even though the first one was like in two parts. Part two. Sorry about Otis being Otis, but you can see he's all happy now. I'm going to get used to that. He's all happy now because he duped me into getting fed one hour earlier than he should. But hey, Philly Phil, out.